It's The Big Take from Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, how the U.S. government is making it harder for companies to silence women who are sexually harassed. With everything happening in the world, you might have missed an important story that hasn't got as much attention as it should. This year, the U.S. Congress passed two big pieces of legislation to protect the rights of women who come forward with charges of sexual abuse in the workplace. President Joe Biden signed the second one into law just this month. Some states, including New York, have also taken action to make it easier for women to sue their harassers. So it seemed like a good time to check in on how much has changed since the beginning of the Me Too movement five years ago, and how much hasn't. I'm here with two members of the U.S. Congress who can help answer those questions. Representative Sherry Bustos, a Democrat from Illinois, and Representative Lois Frankel of Florida, also a Democrat. They were the driving force behind the two new laws I just mentioned. And it's worth noting, by the way, that both of these laws passed the Congress with overwhelming support, not just from Democrats, but Republicans too. Congresswoman Frank, why don't we start with you? Uh, Because just recently, President Joe Biden signed a bill that was passed in November called the Speak Out Act. Can you tell us about this bill? The bill makes unenforceable any pre-dispute non-disclosure agreement. What does that mean? That means these contracts that people are signing when they sign up for a job, I say they always have these, I call them gobbledygook clauses. You don't know what they're saying, but you're signing away your rights. You're signing away your rights to actually come forward and tell somebody, for example, that you've been sexually harassed or abused or raped. Uh, You are silenced. And this new law makes those kind of agreements unenforceable. And these are non-disclosure agreements that if you have a grievance against the workplace, you've signed a piece of paper that says you won't go public with it. You're going to stay quiet. And what this new law says is those are unenforceable. Unenforceable if it's about sexual abuse, sexual harassment or rape, something like that. And what was the inspiration for this bill and how did it come together? Well, you know, when the when the Me Too movements uh, came about, look, sexual harassment, rape, that's been going on as long as we've been human beings, correct? Uh, about two years ago, the, the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, we started holding hearings uh, on the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace. And these are Democratic and Republican, Republican. members of Congress yes. who came together to talk about the these women, issues. It was the women, women members yeah. of Congress. We came together. And we were really shocked at what we heard because, you know, we had, oh, listen, we had heard about Harvey Weinstein and Matt Lauer and the movie stars and so forth. But we started to hear from waitresses who told us they had to endure getting pinched to get their tips. Hotel maids who were wearing panic buttons because they were getting raped by customers. A farm worker who was raped in the fields by her supervisor. Even a tech professional who was told you have to go out on dates to get these jobs. So... We realize this is rampant, and it is. About one in three women in the workplace are sexually harassed. And men are too, but mostly women. There's something very important about this bill that I think everybody should be mindful of and what an NDA is in the first place. One of the reasons was originally to protect corporate secrets that are valuable, trade secrets. And then then it started to be expanded to really cover up everything. And then corporations decided, this is the way we're going to protect our reputation. If people don't know about discrimination, about harassment, about rape, it protects our reputation. So that's so they were silencing uh, victims, or now who are survivors, they were silencing them. What this bill and then the f- forced arbitration bill does, it says, look, we want you to protect your reputation, but you got to do it a different way. It's not by covering up your dirty little secrets. You can protect your reputation by having good management practices, by saying sexual harassment and abuse will not be tolerated, by making sure the management gets that message out and that it's enforced. And that was not the first bill that passed this year to protect women's rights. Congresswoman Bustos, you introduced the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment Act, which 
President Biden signed into law in March. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, can you tell us about that bill? Sure. So uh, we first wrote it in my office back in 2017. So things in Washington don't always move quickly. But how we advanced from 2017, which was really at the height of the Me Too movement, right? How I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm a, I was a journalist and then I worked in healthcare, and then I came to Congress. I'm not a lawyer. Lois is a lawyer. So I read this story about this horrendous, horrendous case of sexual assault, sexual abuse in the workplace, uh, just these horrible stories of being raped, of, of women being asked to undress in front of their male supervisors, of women saying they felt like meat at a meat market, that they couldn't take uh, a male partner to any of their conferences, just, it, it just really some horrible, horrible behavior by the men in this company. And so, and why we had never heard about it was because every complaint that came forward, they had to take it to an arbitrator that was paid for by the company. Employees couldn't sue the company because they had an arbitration agreement similar to the non-disclosure agreement, which you signed that says, nope, you can't talk about it. These forced arbitration agreements say if you have a dispute with the company, you can't sue. You have to go through an arbitrator. That's paid for by the company that most often there is no settlement at all, and most often it is not found in favor of the person who's bringing it forward. So these were these silencing mechanisms, the non-disclosure agreements and the forced arbitration. So the, the two bills that we're talking about, the one uh, by Congresswoman Lois Frankel on non-disclosure agreements, the one that we wrote out of my office on forced arbitration, it really is a one-two punch that we needed to be able to make sure that the survivors of this have an opportunity if they want to go to court and if they want to talk about this, especially with their fellow employees, they can do it now. So both of these laws, both signed this year, had another notable feature to them, which is that they passed with overwhelming support in the House and the Senate, not just from Democrats, but Democrats and Republicans. And that's a pretty uncommon thing these days in Washington where Democrats and Republicans don't agree on anything. How is it that your bills were able to get so much support? So we got 113 Republicans to vote for our forced arbitration. In the House. In the House. 113. Think about that. On the non-disclosure agreement bill, we got 100 Republicans in the House. Both of these bills passed unanimously out of the Senate. The women who testified before the House Judiciary Committee, who were survivors of some horrible, horrible sexual assault, rape, um, harassment in the workplace, their testimony was so powerful that you, you really could not walk away from that and say, I've got to do something about it. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. And these were the hearings while the bill was under consideration. Women came forward to inform the public about what had happened to them. Keep in mind, we had to subpoena them to testify because they were um, operating under non-disclosure agreements and forced arbitration agreements. So they weren't allowed unless they were subpoenaed by Congress to speak. That's correct. And that gave them protection to speak. That's correct. And that's how we they were able to tell their stories. And they were just horrible stories. And uh, so I give them a lot of credit, these survivors who are, have been able to share their stories. And then um, the, the Senate, Lindsey Graham, you know, like in politics, the, the, the phrase about strange bedfellows, he was a real champion. This is Lindsey Graham McCourt, the senator from South Carolina, Republican, a very staunch supporter of former President Donald Trump. Yeah, you might not hear Lois doing a shout out to him, but but I'll, I'll just give him I'll, I'll just give him credit on this. We, we have this news conference when we're announcing the forced arbitration bill and he gets up to the podium and he says uh, a message to the uh, businesses out there. It is bad business to have these forced arbitration clauses for sexual harassment, and sexual assault. And so I th it was a really strong message, and the Republicans stood up to what is a, a lot of times their foundation of their party. And, um, you know, that could be big business. It, it, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce lobbied hard against our bills. So we had, had a little different experience just in terms of members. Uh, we had uh, Ken Buck in the House who worked hard both on my bill and on Sherry's, uh, on, on the arbitration bill. Another Republican sponsor Another Republican. And in the Senate, the champion really was Senator Marsha Blackburn. A Republican of Tennessee. Republican and, and Kirsten Gillibrand, who was the, uh, also one of the Senate sponsors. But 
Uh, some of the senators put hold on the bill in the Senate, and Marsha Blackburn swatted them down. What were their uh, objections when they put a hold on? Some of them are just ornery. They put a hold on everything. There's some of them. I, I say, look, sometimes it's politically driven, and sometimes it's value driven. I'm not going to say which was which. The fact is, these two bills, they were historically probably two of the biggest labor bills to give rights uh, to people in the workplace in a very, very long time. My conversation with Representatives Frankel and Bustos continues after the break. Both of these bills, of course, protect women who come forward. And men. And men. Women. Yes. That's a good point because it does protect men, too, on the basis of sexual harassment. But, of course, there are all kinds of other forms of harassment, racial discrimination, uh, age discrimination. Do you see this as kind of the narrow end of the wedge that once you get these, then later other forms of protection will inevitably follow? Well, I can't think of a Democrat who is not in favor of adding racial discrimination, age discrimination, LGBTQ discrimination. Anything illegal. Anything illegal. We would love to have that. In fact, Hank Johnson, who is a member of Congress from Georgia, he has a bill that includes all of that. And the problem is we cannot get enough support on the other side of the aisle. And so we made this decision again after I found out what forced arbitration was five years ago, that we were going to do this carve out and at least try to make some progress in this area. And I think that's the same thing with uh, Congresswoman Frankel. She it's like, yeah, we want non-disclosure agreements and all of this, but we also want success and we wanted to move things forward. People understand the, 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 pol- the politics, and they say it's like making sausage. But this is a pretty good sausage. But that doesn't mean that any form of illegal discrimination should not be silenced. That's my opinion. As Sherry said, that's every Democrat I know would agree with that. Maybe some Republicans, but I could tell you this, uh, there are members who have been trying to get these bills passed for a long time. And the thing that we are facing as of January 3rd of next year, of 2023, is that the majority in the House will change. That's so, when the new Congress is sworn in. It'll be a Republican House after the midterm elections. The, the, the Senate, of course, will still be under the control of Democrats. Right. So, But what will happen with that is Hank Johnson's bill, that's a very good bill, probably won't see the light of day after the Republicans take the majority in the House. Um, So yet again, we'll probably have to go another two years, and then hopefully the Congress will be able to make some progress after that. So what's next? Uh, These are two big bills. You've described them as being historic bills. Hard to argue with that. Um, Where do you go from here? Obviously, this is something that could actually put a dent in this kind of behavior, um, and yet there's so much further to go. Well, I think what's next, I mean, we can't, you can't just say, okay, we did this and move on. The word has to get out because most people, think about it, they have no idea that this bill was signed. They still don't know they signed an agreement. And so getting the word out, making sure that corporations know they can enforce these agreements. And I really, I think spreading the word is very important. Forced arbitration clauses and non-disclosure agreements will still be in employment contracts. They will still be in, for instance, the terms and conditions box that you check off when you're, you know, put, downloading some app, if you're doing a rideshare app, if you're hiring a moving company, if you, they will still be there. Um, and you have to think about the unscrupulous businesses that are still out there who will not make aware to the customer or to the employee that as it pertains to sexual harassment or sexual assault, those are null and void. But how many businesses are going to say, oh, by the way, even though you were harassed and even though you were, you know, attacked or whatever, those don't apply. So so to Lois's point, we want to make sure that people know about it, that lawyers know about that, this, that that employees do, that customers do. And, you know, a lot of times you, you write a bill and you, you see it all the way through and then you move on to your next thing. It, it is going to take our good friends in the media. It's going to take making sure that we're going out and talking to bar associations and the chambers and um, all of that to make sure that people know that these are null and void as of 2022. Representative Lois Frankel, Representative Sherry Bustos, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you. Thank you, Wes.
Let's pull back the lens a bit now and take a broader look at how things have changed in the workplace since Me Too began and what more needs to be done, because there's a lot. To spell that out, I'm joined by Fatima Goss-Graves, president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center here in Washington, and my colleague, Rebecca Greenfield, who leads Bloomberg's equality coverage. She's in New York. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. So happy to be here. I was just speaking with two members of Congress, Sherry Bustos and Lois Frankel, about uh, two laws that were recently signed that really put in place protections that didn't exist before for employees and companies who have been sexually harassed. Those would seem like two significant steps forward. New York has recently come forward and suspended the statute of limitations in civil lawsuits for sexual abuse cases. And so it seems like in some ways, uh, things are being done that have made us come a bit of the way further than they were before. Let me start with you, Fatima. How do you see things going and, and where are things working and where are they really not? Yeah, we've been tracking this very closely, um, trying to understand the impact that Me Too has had uh, since Me Too went viral. And what we know is that overall, 22 states and D.C. have passed more than 70 workplace anti-harassment bills. And, and they range, right? Some of them are about things like the statute of limitations. Others have passed and have focused on which workers are covered, extending their non-discrimination protections, for example, to independent contractors. Are there some industries that are, are leading the way for others? You know, th that's a harder thing to measure. In, in some ways, we know that there are some uh, indicators that create opportunities for harassment. And so, for example, sectors that also pay really low wages and have other conditions of work that um, are sometimes abusive to workers, th those are spaces where harassment thrives. It's also the case, though, that harassment often thrives in workplaces where women make up only a small percentage of those either in power overall or um, on the job, right? So you, you are more likely to see harassment in these historically very male professions like finance, Wall Street, but also like construction, where there are longstanding reports of harassment. One of the things that you have seen, on, on the other hand, in uh, the aftermath of Me Too going viral are employers uh, at the very, very top, you know, CEOs, C-suite individuals, naming that this was critical to them, following through with programs, taking very seriously allegations of harassment, putting in place policies. And so I actually think what we'll have to do is measure the impact of that level of leadership over time. Rebecca, in your coverage of equality, what changes have you seen both from the worker side and from employers in, in protecting people from harassment? Yeah, so I think with, when we talk about the Me Too movement, there's kind of this mis- understanding or misconstruing that it's about like harassment will never happen and you know and I think that's that's never been the case they're always going to be bad actors I mean there shouldn't be and we should hope for that but it's about the way that the system deals with them and creating cultures where it's not tolerated and rules and laws that can handle the behavior and I do think that's where we've seen changes broadly like with these laws that you're talking about I think we've seen it even just standards have changed for the way the things we deem acceptable or you know i was just thinking of one ex a couple examples of ceos or people who've been in charge who um you know they didn't disclose consensual relationships and they they lost their jobs or felt like they needed to step down kind of there is just a greater expectation that we're going to be more transparent about those things just i think there is less tolerance for the behavior. And that's really what I think has been one of the more noticeable changes across industries broadly. Have you seen a rise in the number of women who are now willing to come forward 
uh, than there were before Me Too, just in general? Our, our laws don't treat people who make very serious allegations well, and our laws don't treat people who um, have been accused of very serious things well. It's, it just isn't really set up. And yet, despite those structural problems in our legal system, um, survivors keep coming forward. And even though everything would tell you that that's not a good idea, people come forward even though they're still shaming and blaming. They come forward still. And I think that in part was the power of Me Too. More with Fatima Goss Graves and Rebecca Greenfield when we come back. Fatima, you said that our laws are not set up well to handle people who come forward. Could you elaborate on that a bit more? Yeah, many people feel as if they have been re abused by our legal system. And, and that's not a good thing. And some of that is that, you know, it is set up where you have to keep telling your story over and over again. And to people whose whole role is to be skeptical of you. So some of it is, is really the structural of what it means to come forward. Some of it is that we have rules in place that mean in most states, you have to come forward very quickly. You have to have made a decision about your desire to, you know, have a legal claim of some sort and, and, and act on that very quickly. When um, that's not really how the cycle of recovery works for people, it usually takes a long time. But if you have 180 days or 300 days or in some states a couple of years to be able to make a state claim, it is really, really difficult to do all of that in a short time. It's not usually the first thing people are thinking about. And beyond that, beyond the short time periods, we are still in a situation where retaliation is pretty typical. On this point that, you know, the, the sometimes the laws aren't set up to perfectly meet people where they are. We just had a really great story run on Bloomberg recently about this new law in New York that extended cases that may have passed the statute of limitations for sexual abuse and harassment claims. And the story was about how there have been all these claims made for these suits. You know, these people had experiences before, but for whatever reason, didn't report them. And now, you know, we've kind of closed this loophole with this law that's allowing a flood of cases, a lot of them which are have been high profile. There, these allegations are coming forward because of this, you know, pretty slight tweak to a law. Fatima, a lot of companies have put in place changes, new policies to protect women who come forward. But have you seen more willingness within companies now to actually investigate, especially high ranking executives, when a harassment claim is made? Most people don't even report allegations of harassment. They don't, like, if they experience harassment, they often don't tell anyone, let alone go to HR and make a formal complaint. But the thing that I would say that is a shift is that companies in, and, and their boards are understanding that the risk analysis around not addressing harassment at work has shifted. So, you know, it. I would say it used to be probably that the easiest path of resistance for a lot of uh, places was to do very little. Well, that creates additional risk for sure. And, um, and so I, I think companies, organizations generally are learning about this a little bit in real time. They're learning from high profile cases, sort of watching organizations and their boards who failed to take appropriate measures and then found themselves with not only a giant legal claim, but a public relations claim that was much bigger than if they had just addressed it on the front end. It, you know, it's not a new idea that harassment is against the law. So the things that we can do now to make a difference are change loopholes in the law that mean that more people are covered, that the, that the consequences for harassment are steeper, 
that it is easier to bring claims, that you don't encounter hurdles, including the fact that you have to be silent. So we can change those incentives and we can better enforce the law, including the longtime constant ban on retaliation. Fatima Goss Graves and Rebecca Greenfield, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You can read all of Bloomberg's equality coverage on Bloomberg.com. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Read today's story and subscribe to our daily newsletter at Bloomberg.com slash Big Take. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with questions or comments to Big Take at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producer is Federica Romaniello. Our associate producer is Zenib Siddiqui. Rafael Amsili is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.